We're recording. Perfect. All right, welcome everyone. It's good to see everyone. We're right at about one o'clock, so we'll get started. Elizabeth, I think you're on and you're gonna kick it off for us. I am, great. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and welcome to everybody. Um, Good afternoon and welcome to the second Broadband Action Plan listening session. It's great to have you all here today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Dewar and I am the Caltrans Broadband Facilities Coordinator and the moderator for today's session. Before we get started, I wanted just to cover a few logistics for this afternoon. Uh, nothing new, similar to other meetings. But today's meeting is being recorded and I wanted to share that with you. The video will be posted to the Broadband Council website for future reference. And again, the process for today, for those who wish to speak, um, please go ahead and indicate your name and the organization that you represent in the chat so we can see um, who's in line next to talk and how many people are in the queue. This will allow us to allot our time accordingly because we do have a very short amount of time today. In addition, also feel free to enter comments in the chat um, because we will be able to save the chat information for our use and reference. And if someone has already stated the similar comment to yours, please indicate that you agree um, and emphasize your agreement with that comment. So just a reminder, uh, please be sure that you're muted if you're not speaking. All right, let's get started here. So on behalf of the California State Transportation so, uh, Depart uh, State Transportation Agency and the California Department of Transportation, I'd like to welcome you to today's State Broadband Action Plan listening session for local agencies. The focus today is on the continued development of the action plan. During today's listening session, we're looking for your input and your thoughts on the outline of the draft action plan. We're hoping everyone's had a chance to look at it, possibly participate in the CBC monthly meetings um, and provide some feedback already. Today's agenda includes a status of the development of the State Broadband Action Plan, which will be presented by Stephanie Tom, Deputy Director of Strategic Planning, Broadband, and Digital Literacy from the California Department of Technology. Following the status, Anne Neville Bonilla, Director of the California Research Bureau from the California State Library, will be joining me to facilitate discussion on the action plan. At this time, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Tom, again, the California Department of Technology's Deputy Director of Strategic Planning, Broadband, and Digital Literacy. Stephanie? Great, thanks, Elizabeth. And once again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so thrilled, actually, to have you on the second listening session for local government. Um, as you know, we had our first session a few weeks ago, and we've had quite a bit of activity since that time. Um, as a gentle reminder, of course, we have a variety of listening sessions, and ironically enough, all of the second round of listening sessions is happening today in one day. So this morning we had the listening session, the second listening session for the community for non-government organizations, regional consortia. This, of course, listening session is specifically for local government. And then, of course, later today, we'll also have a listening session for providers. Um, although the listening sessions are targeted to specific audiences, they are an open forum and public format, so anyone can join. I do see we have a couple providers on the line today as well because inquiring minds want to know, and we do want to make sure, um, of course, that everybody understands that this is an open forum and we welcome the feedback. I wanted to share a little bit more with you about what we've been doing since we met last time very briefly and then really going to turn it over to Anne Elizabeth because we have a very short time today. We have a one hour for this listening session. Since we met last time, we have taken all of the collective feedback that you've provided, so we appreciate your time and we created a list of recommended actions. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because we want you to know that we truly are listening. 
We want you to know that we are taking all of the collective feedback, we're reviewing it with the council members, and of course with the reviewing core team, and we want to make sure that we are in alignment with the needs and the recommendations and the input that we're hearing from you. So from the last session, we've actually derived approximately 20 actions from this group. Um, it, was, it was a great discussion, of course, led by Anna and Elizabeth, and looking forward to a very fruitful and rich discussion today. The difference, of course, between the first session and this one is that, of course, since that time, we've developed a detailed outline for the broadband action plan. We've discussed that outline with the California Broadband Council at the meeting on October 23rd, and we're going to follow that process moving forward. We are, of course, going to make sure that as a result of these listening sessions, continue to augment and continue to update and refine the broadband action plan, where our goal for the next California Broadband Council meeting on November 18th is to have a plan that it's a draft of about 80%. So we continue to move at a very rapid pace an accelerated pace, as everyone continues to tell me, since the, most states take about a year to create their plan. But of course, California, um, being a leader and wanting to make sure that we serve our citizens, we're doing it in about four months. So I appreciate your time today. Um, know that in addition to the sessions that you are participating in, of course, a gentle reminder that we always have additional ways that you can provide public comment. That is either through the California Broadband Council email inbox where you can always submit comment. Um, and of course, all of those written comments are posted to the website as well. And then of course, we invite you to also join the California Broadband Council meetings where you can hear the discussions that take place between the council members. And of course, you can share your input there too. But without further ado, we do wanna get this session started and I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth before we start our facilitated discussion. I think you're on mute, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Stephanie, taking a little while there. So let me reshare my screen. Um, I think as we've all experienced some um, internet connections and I've been having just a little bit of problems today with my internet. So um, the first question I wanted to start with today is um, I wanted to ask everyone, is the overall flow of the broadband action plan moving in the right direction? Uh, some, some questions to consider in that respect is, what areas are critical and what's missing? So again, if you've had a chance to look at the broadband action plan, um, we've talked about the vision, setting the vision, we've talked about deployment and adoption, and there's been quite a detailed discussion on download and upload and, and a lot of details in terms of what belongs in each section. But from your perspective, how do you feel the overall flow of the plan is moving? So similar to the last session, please feel free to just unmute and introduce yourself. Um, we just like a very casual flowing conversation and thank you for bringing up that slide. Thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Hey everyone, this is Alex Bond from the City and County of San Francisco. Um, yeah, I'm just looking over the, the plan outline right now. Uh, so just give me a second to, to review it. Um, yeah, I, I found a link on the website. It's the one that was presented in the October 23rd meeting. That, is that right? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Let me just put the link in the chat too for, for everyone else who might need it. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, this is Ross Millerick. Um, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Ross. Hi, yes, hi. I'm with ahead. the Nevada Unified School District. I'm, I'm on the board of trustees. And we are struggling with access to children at home. We have the basic case that is we have three children trying to use Zoom simultaneously while mom's uh, dad's watching TV and mom's trying to pay the bills. And we keep having students glitch out. So I think the requirement for at home education is needs to be fully incorporated in this requirement and maybe increase the capacity 
targets. Thank you, Ross. Again, feel, feel free to, to put your name in the chat box if you want to talk or just go ahead and unmute yourself and share any ideas. We've had, um, you know, this is, this is great discussion. We have talked about this, again, the upload and download speeds and, you know, at least if we have some short-term goals and long-term goals and what should those be. But overall, in terms of the plan, are there any, any sections that you think are missing, any major ideas? Anything that's critical that the state should include in this action plan um, that that might be missing? Yeah, this is Cole Prisabella. I'm with the County of Tuolumne, and I'm the Innovation and Business Assistance Director. Um, one piece that I do think that we're bringing up in our region that would be a, a help if it was a coordinated effort with the state is the idea of what are the ordinances and policies that we should implement uh, in place in the general plans and our local governments because we necessarily don't have a broadband expert uh, at a local county level so a state um, assistance in setting those suggestions I believe would be a, a helpful resource in this action plan. All right thank you Cole. Hi this is uh, Steve Monahan I'm the CIO for the county of Nevada and um, my main, as I read the outline, I really think there needs to be more emphasis on uh, funding and the funding models that are out there. Um, the CASF uh, grant program really needs complete reform. Um, it's not working for our community. Uh, it has a lot of issues. It's not getting money uh, into our community. We have a, a great middle mile project. It's been lit up for, I don't know, five, six, seven years uh, from the ARA projects, and not one single provider has tapped into it. You know, there's no last mile build out, even though we have this robust middle mile. So I really think uh, it needs more emphasis on how are you going to actually fund and make those home connections, um, those last mile connections, and get those put in place. And it really comes down to funding. It's the only way it's going to happen. And we need reform on CASF. Uh, our county, we've implemented our own local grant program. Uh, we don't have a lot of money for it. But I think a model where uh, uh, the CASF could be uh, in partnership with local jurisdictions, cities and counties, just like we do for law enforcement, for emergency services, for health and human services, for dozens of state programs that are administered locally, we should be doing that with broadband. Broadband shouldn't be just coming out of the CPUC in the state by itself uh, to our communities. We should be leveraging our local jurisdictions just like we do for a whole host of those other services that we administer and do locally. And uh, we have a model that's working and we would love to share that. Um, so I've got a lot of other thoughts, but I won't monopolize the time. So thank you. Steve, can I ask you a follow-up question? Um, sure. You know, you've been um, good to see you. You've been you've been uh, deeply involved in this issue for you know, a couple decades. Um, the what um, you mentioned the partnership with local government. What else specifically would you like to see changed in CISF that you think would um, increase you know, make it a uh, it increase the amount of infrastructure projects that are getting out there? Well, I think the whole, the whole challenge um, from incumbent providers is broken. It's preventing people who want to do a project. It's not worth their time. It's too painful. You know, it took us almost 10 years to get our first fiber to the home project uh, approved. And that was a very, very long, painful Process. I don't know how many times uh, we drove down to San Francisco to testify at the CPUC to support that project. Um, and, you know, the, the applicant had some issues, but it was just challenge after challenge after challenge. Uh, incumbents have nothing to lose to keep challenging. They just gain time, they, they create more customers because they have more time, and then they use that to make more challenges. I mean, it was just ongoing forever. Um, 
So that whole challenge process has to be uh, fixed. You know, we're, we have large census blocks, we have challenging topology with hills and mountains and valleys and depressions, and um, the, the coverage maps just don't work. You know, I mean, I, everybody's heard that. They just don't work. So using those and building that in to the applicant requirement for all the onuses on the applicant to prove that it's an unserved area or underserved area, it just doesn't work. It's not worth their, their time, um, their energy, their, <laughs> their, their investment uh, for the low probability. And I've talked to all of our providers. None of them have applied for a CSF project. And we have this robust, you know, vast network, the whole Seabin project, middle mile project, very robust in our community. And we have two high schools in the county library hooked up to it. You know, and it's been in place for years. So something's broken there, right? Um, we've changed our, our strategy to go more neighborhood based, looking at more neighborhood co-op based. And we've done that with our local grant program, kind of looking at that Hammond, Idaho open access model. Um, so if there was a way that we can um, partner with the state to promote those kind of projects, it'd be great. But we're not going to see another 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 fiber to the home project in our county because it just could never get approved through the process that's currently in place with CASF. No provider's going to go through that much pain. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hi, this is Wally Simbab from the South Bay Cities Council of Governments. Um, I think that the action plan would benefit from having a separate section on pilot projects. One of the things that's impressed me from listening to um, all the different sessions that I've been in is the incredible, incredible diversity in context. And, and given that there's different layers of problems that, that include access and adoption and digital training and so forth, I think it would be very interesting, not, not that the state's going to fund it, but if it could endorse pilot projects that, that are solicited through this process that um, describe how they would deal in the context they exist in, how they would deal with some of these problems, either separately or individually or together. But I think being able to take action and being endorsed for those actions and realizing that a lot of this public policy is an experiment, uh, it would be great to identify um, some of those. And a little self-serving because I understand that I did propose such a thing. But, I, but I'll give you brief, briefly an example of a context. Uh, under access in the plan, it taught, and maybe we're gonna get to this, but anyway, I'm here now. Um, it says that the quality uh, speed of service um, varies dramatically by the income of the community. And that's probably true in some places. It's not true in the South Bay. Um, what we have is an abuse of monopoly power that, that they're from the very richest areas to the very poorest areas, people complain all the time about the carriers. They're, they're just overcharging and under delivering. And it has nothing to do with income. It has to do with the fact that that's, that's what they do. And so much so that we build our own, the municipal, build our own um, backbone network uh, because of the savings that we could get beyond, below what it is that they were charging cities. So, you know, I, in respect to the different context, I'm really impressed. And I think it would be great if we solicited solutions specific to those contexts rather than looking for some statewide policy that fits all. Thank you, Wally. Those are um, those are really good thoughts, and and I I, I agree with you on that. So we want to hear from everyone else and and not listen to me opine. Um, thank you, Bernie. We see your comment in the chat that um, that as was shared earlier, there's a lot of students that are having challenges with broadband speeds, and so we see that that you also suggest that the report. Um, require that the Department of Education establish some minimum broadband speeds for uh, distance learning. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at that and, and, and consider that for the report as well. So I don't want to stop this great conversation. We've touched on a few things coming up, but there's um, quite a few 
other questions that we wanted to try and get to to focus on. And um, the next one here is, how might the state support local broadband planning efforts in communities? And we talked a little bit about this. Um, we, heard, we heard from Steve, too, that there's got to be some, some um, efforts in the local communities. It can't all be done at state. But if there is something, what, what can that be? Also, um, how might communities want to share the information or best practices around broadband adoption? Um, is there already a forum that exists to share this information? And if not, do we need something like that? Um, if it does, is there ways to improve it? So any thoughts or input on that? Uh, Cole, hi. Cole, do you have your hand raised? Oh, sure, yeah. So I can speak to both the, the, the community part, but also I just wanted to echo Wally's comment a second ago about um, maybe not a one fits all solution as I know, just for an example, we are gonna be very different than the South Bay where we do not have the ability or the option to create a municipal network. So we're gonna have to be completely reliant on helping to foster a, a private solution and encouraging more private adoption. So as much as I would love to have a municipal network, it probably won't work for us in the Central Sierra at this point. But the, the second component of this, which is that the idea of this, um, you're saying how to share information. We're creating a five county action plan. I talked about it earlier at one of your other broadband sessions, but one of the components of the, the broadband action plan we're creating is how to effectively share that information. And what will end up happening is we're gonna have a website directly tailored for this plan that we're creating for the five counties so that internet service providers can research from a, a local five county uh, effort, what are the permits needed? Where are those uh, data spots that need some uh, infrastructure? And then where are the, the five county priorities as well as anchor institutions and a lot of the assets already in the com community. So I think a, a similar effort from a state level where there's either a part of your California Department of Technology or a, a standalone website that shares all of the different pilot projects or this action plan would be very useful for, for us from county levels, but I also think internet service providers. Great, thanks so much Cole for that. Did I see someone else wanted to make a comment? Uh, I would, this is Steve again, I'd make a comment where the state could really help and that is you know, all these projects have to meet CEQA, which is required, which is appropriate. Um, but it's a big hurdle and bar to get up to for some of these smaller providers and projects. So having a statewide, we're looking at, can we do a countywide EIR um, on broadband deployment so that it would apply to any provider wanting to come in and do kind of a smaller neighborhood based project. But if, if the state could do something like that on a state level, um, I know they did some stuff when they were doing all those ARA projects, um, that would really be beneficial. And it would make those projects have a lot less friction in moving forward, especially the smaller, less sophisticated uh, providers. And it would let more money go to connections rather than to uh, EIR consultants. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. This is, uh, this is Jeff Neal at um, the State Association of Counties. Um, thanks for uh, continuing to, to hold these. I think kind of tying this into, um, into a little bit of what Steve was saying also, and, and others are saying on the previous question, I, I think that one of the things the state can do, or at least one part of the state is, is as he was saying, reforming some of the rules uh, for the, the high cost fund. Obviously it's not something the locals can do on our own. Um, and I, I don't know that we're gonna, you know, go through the whole rigmarole of everything that should be changed. And, uh, you know, we're not gonna put all the reforms I suspect in the uh, broadband plan itself, but I think Steve's brought up some, some great ideas, you know, and we, we brought up some things on the previous uh, listening session as well, things like, um, um, explicit authority uh, that gives uh, local agencies 
the same right to build as uh, as others. Um, you know, taking down some of the barriers. Um, Steve is mentioning this time the um, you know the challenge process. Um, that's that's absolutely a barrier to building out to um, to areas that don't have broadband. Uh, or uh, uh, at least uh, whether it's unserved or underserved. Um, so I think some of these, I know there's some reforms we can't really make because of federal restrictions that would make all of this easier. Um, but given the, um, we can uh, bloom where we're planted and, um, uh, and you know, still change some of these rules that have been uh, in place for a while that I think have been barriers to build out. I forgot one other thing. The other one that came up last time that I want to put a plus mark next to was the um, how the how the the using the use of census areas uh, to to determine served and unserved um, because um, it's not um, it's a it's a very blunt instrument. Yeah, that's that's a good point. All right, great. Thank you. I see in the chat that Liza from Marin County agrees with Jeff. Thank you. And Wally, Wally, did you have a comment on local planning efforts that you wanted yeah, to Yeah, I sure do. Um, one of the virtues of, of getting old is that you've been around a long time. And uh, there was a time in the middle 70s, early, the 70s and early 80s, in which um, locals did uh, cable television programming <clears throat> and I had a national consultancy at that time and there really was not a city in the country that did not have a group meeting in the basement of a church or in city hall or something like that that wasn't talking about their telecommunications future. It was a pretty exciting time and it taught all kinds of literacy about policy and, and about technology. But in I think it was 92, the state of California consolidated the franchising in the state and so most of that, all of it, was really kind of wiped out. So the best way, if you want local broadband planning efforts in communities, is you have to assign some sort of responsibility to them. And right now, the state owns all of it. Uh, so one of the benefits of the proposal I made, which was a, a, in the middle mile open access model, is to do a middle mile direct access, where you would go on a pilot project into uh, disadvantaged communities and organize them around what they want their digital future to be and we would incorporate that into a, a, a neighborhood scale network access facility that was public and that engages them in what their future would be it is it would lead to really substantial local planning much like we had back in the 70s and 80s so I, I think the bottom line here is if you if you really want local planning efforts, broadband efforts, you really have to give some sort of uh, responsibility to the locals. And this is one way to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. We appreciate that. So um, we've got a few other questions here. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Um, for each item, but uh, we can always come back if, if there's some areas that we want to touch on. I see Anne has asked a question in the chat. If people want to respond during some of these questions or just respond in the chat box, that because we don't have a specific question here today, but if how many of you have broadband incorporated into your 10-year plan? So if you might want to share that in the chat with us. I'm looking forward again into the, the plan and in the plan, we do reference um, short and long-term efforts. And we wanted to find out what's your comfort level with the definition of short-term and long-term as six months and 18 months. And can you support broadband progress with these um, definitions of short-term and long-term? So what are your thoughts on that? So again, we're looking to see what can be accomplished short term, what can be accomplished long term, and um, you know what does that mean to you? Sure, and Elizabeth, let me provide a little bit of context here. We actually asked this on the previous session. It seems a little, um, maybe a little random, but the reason why this came up is because naturally 
we've created this new effort into an action plan. And because of that, we are moving in the directions as I spoke about at the top of the hour around specific recommended actions that the state and frankly, the broader ecosystem of um, the community should be taking. So with that, you could see in the plan that we talk about, okay, what, are we, what do we need to do in the short term? And then what do we need to do in the long term? And then throughout discussion, it came out, okay, so is six months really feasible? or should it be you know, one year? And the reason why we wanted to ask this group specifically is because um, it's within, of course, the localities and the local government, um, just as even Steven mentioned, or even Jeff, or even Wally, about understanding truly what's possible, right? What's feasible and the amount of time and the time frame that we should actually be stating in the plan. So it's just a very quick, um, quick question that we wanted your quick feedback on. Um, some of the feedback that we received specifically from Tom West who's of course uh, part of the regional consortium on the previous call was saying, six months is too fast, you know, maybe short term should be 12 months, but um, just wanted your quick feedback on this, if anyone's comfortable. And I see actually in the chat here um, that there's agreement with Tom's recommendation, so I appreciate it. And while we're waiting, I just want to ask again, um, if you are putting a comment into the chat, please include your affiliation. Thank you. Okay, and seeing some other agreement uh, that one year probably is a little bit, maybe of a better time frame. So I appreciate that. Great. Okay, we can actually, um, Elizabeth, move on from this question, but I do want to circle back to Anne's question, if people don't mind either chiming in live on um, the Zoom call or even putting in chat, because I really am curious about how many um, local governments have broadband in their plan. This is something that continues to be brought up, that we need to have a better idea of who is focusing on broadband so that we, of course, know, and that comes back to data, but it'd be great just to have an idea. Yeah, and I see, Steve, thank you for sharing that um, you've published a new broadband specific plan last year and, and shared your website. So we appreciate that. Anybody else want to share about their community plan? I guess the, the follow up to that, I mean, that was in, in one of the previous questions, but, you know, there had been some work. I mean, I think this is, you know, probably about 15 years ago now, but around, you know, really working with the, you know, the, the planners in, in cities and counties and really incorporating, um, incorporating broadband and internet access as uh, just as folks are looking at transit, at, you know, schools, at all, everything else that's part of the, the community. Um, and that was when I was in, I was in San Diego at the time and we were working on that, but I was curious um, if that's something, you know, and does that engage folks who aren't normally part of that, who aren't normally part of the broadband process, right? Um, or see it maybe only from one side like permitting, but aren't, don't necessarily get to see it from all, with all the other benefits that, that come with it. Hi, this is. Oh, go ahead, Liza. Oh, hey, Steve. This is Liza Massey from Red County. I put a few notes in there, but uh, I felt this was too long. We have uh, in September kicked off a process to create a uh, digital infrastructure plan. Obviously, the end result is broadband for all and digital literacy. Uh, we we're engaging all of our different stakeholders, and so I just got off a call with. Um, our Marin Municipal uh, Managers Association, all the town and city managers and the county administrator, they're gonna be the project sponsors. We have created an executive steering committee that has a representative from each of our stakeholder groups, education, business, community, um, health, um, government, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, economic development. We have about 10, we have a, a group of 11. Um, and so we will be engaging our Oh, and our providers are going to, we, you know, we'll be working with our providers. We, our plan will be uh, collaborative, comprehensive, and obviously we will engage the planning groups for each of those areas and make sure that it's not just a separate, 
you know, pie in the sky document out there that it really represents collaboratively what Marin wants to do. And we're calling our e effort Digital Marin. And so it's a, it's a big idea, but uh, we're getting a lot of um, uh, positive feedback and people signing up, even our residents signing up to get started. This is hey, Eliza. Make a comment on municipal broadband for the question. And that is, I think I'm a proponent of municipal broadband. I think it works best in cities that already have a utility department of some type. Um, you know, they're already providing water, sewer, uh, some type, or they already have a connection to the home. Uh, as a rural county, you know, we've had a lot of people say, why don't we get into that business? And we have no infrastructure. We don't provide water, sewer, or any other utility. You know, it would be a multi, multi-million dollar initiative, a new department for the county to get into that business. But there are other local utilities that have that connection to the home. You know, we're working with our water district and um, they've been running dark fiber. So we put them up with uh, race communications who's doing a fiber to the home project and that's helped them expand their footprint by being able to leverage that. But again, it goes back to regulations um, too, because we had on the Eastern side, the Truckee Tahoe uh, utility district had planned to do a fiber to the home project and the incumbents brought them into lawsuits for five years to the point that their board flipped and they killed the project. Um, so th there has to be some kind of reform on that side to, to make that happen. Hey everyone, this is Alex uh, from San Francisco again. Um, yeah, we're definitely proponents of municipal broadband and um, you know, we've, in the past uh, we've developed a, a citywide uh, municipal fiber plan. Um, and currently, you know, we've decided to, to pretty much to, to start smaller and, and where the biggest needs are, which is our, our low income uh, affordable housing and, and public housing sites. Um, so yeah, for the past couple of years, um, we've been leveraging our city's um, own fiber network um, and extending it to, you know, these large multifamily housing sites. And, you know, through a partnership with both the housing provider um, who works to upgrade the inside wiring and, and a local ISP called Monkey Brains were able to deliver uh, free fact service for, for thousands of residents with this model. Um, you know, echoing Steve, I think, you know, one huge area of support that the state could provide is, is to help the, the housing providers and the housing developers with the inside wiring piece. Um, because, you know, often that's, that's really the, the quote unquote last mile challenge that we're seeing in urban areas, right? You have, you have fiber, you know, nearby, we'll send fiber to the building, but, um, you know, if the building has, you know, really old copper wiring that just can't, that we just can't tap into, then, you know, it's really hard to provide that service. Um, so whether it's, you know, state guidelines to, to include um, wiring upgrades in, in housing or, um, you know, funding, um, I, I would like to see, you know, the inside wiring piece for multifamily housing uh, be incorporated in the state broadband plan. Hey, Alex, this is Ann. I just wanted to comment, you know, an interesting piece on that is it, um, on the anchor institution side. I mean, we see that a lot in schools and libraries. Um, and for sure, that was one of the big barriers to overcome uh, with, as we've been on a, this is just with my state library hat, um, you know, a, a seven year project to connect all of the libraries. And um, in a lot of areas where there was a lot of outdated infrastructure, the inside wiring was sometimes, you know, more difficult, um, was much more difficult than getting the, um, uh, than uh, getting the, the connectivity to the, the area. So it's, be in some ways useful of thinking about these and and you know as we think about affordable housing right as a it's a it's an it, it's an anchor institution of you know in in that same way great and i know that uh, i just wanted to share um with that we recognize that ross um in the chat had asked about um access for for radio um, connectivity and um, and so Ferdinand Milanes he is with the Caltrans division of maintenance and he has shared that yes that we should absolutely 
um, consider those networks for the last mile or to fill in gaps. So thank you both, Ross and Ferdinand. The, the, there's some radio networks running in Alameda and others, and they, they basically compete with fiber carriers. And so there's plenty of market discussions that have to go along with that conversation. Um, or, or maybe, you know, so it's not a simple topic at all. Thank you. Oops. Okay, skipped ahead there a little too quickly. Okay. Any other thoughts, or we can um, maybe go on to a, a few other questions here. So, what are some successful use cases you have partnering with providers, either local or incumbents? I know we've heard about some challenges today. Um, I think we're looking to also see maybe some cases where it's worked and those thoughts and ideas can be incorporated into the action plan as possibly some, some best practices. Yeah, I could chime in again about, you know, our, our partnership with the local ISP. Um, you know, they're called Monkey Brains. They're a smaller ISP that operates mostly in San Francisco and some other cities in the Bay Area. Um, so, yeah, basically they're the, the internet access, the internet service provider for our fiber to housing project. Um, and they're doing this for free. Um, you know, basically, you know, we're trying to make things as easy for them as possible. Uh, because, you know, the, the cost of de delivering internet, you know, really isn't like the network traffic management or, or you know, the moving <laughs> the bits back and forth. It's, it's on the front end, getting the infrastructure to the site, you know, making sure you have some kind of backhaul, making sure there's adequate inside wiring. And then afterwards, it's providing the, the resident engagement and the, the outreach and the, and the ongoing tech support. So, you know, through our partnership, you know, we have uh, kind of a collective action model where different entities take care of these different pieces and offload a lot of that work to the ISPs. Um, and it's also a community driven model. So for um, a lot of the outreach and, and, and tech support, you know, we're doing as much as we can with, uh, you know, community uh, with resident leaders and resident service providers on the ground um, to, to take the lead on that. Um, and that way, you know, monkey brains, you know, there's just much less cost to them to incur for, for partnering on the service. Thank you. Any other thoughts or ideas on some on partnering with providers that seem to be successful? This is Ross again. Um, I think I'm reaching out to the competitive local exchange carriers in some structured way so they compete in the market, but inviting them to the table for the conversation is a worthwhile thing to do. It increases the competition. Like monkey brains. And this is Wally again. I can share where we want to go. I mentioned that we have this uh, basically middle mile, the backbone network and a middle mile network that we were able to build using transportation funds and then savings from the from the from the cost, I think where we want to go next is into in, we had one city take a look at what it would cost to build it out uh, to how to businesses and households and it's not a large city um, and it was seventy three million dollars and cities are they can borrow it sure they can get bonds and all this kind of stuff but I don't think they want to take on the risk of doing that so where I think we want to go next is to start looking at maybe uh, microcarriers who would join in the market on a, uh, you know, join our ring network, our middle mile, and build out certain uh, neighborhoods or cities uh, to be, to bring competition to these incumbents who are overcharging and under providing. So that I think is our next step. And I think this public network access facility is a step on that. So it gives you direct access there and it will help market the home-based and business-based services. So anyway, that's an experiment we're hoping to move into. But I think that it starts in terms of state helping the helping everybody get uh, the the local governments put together, or the, in our case, a sub-regional government, a um, backbone network that provides a middle mile so that we can start soliciting some of these micro vendors. I'm gonna, this is Ross, I'm gonna make a, an alternative suggestion 
Moran County 40 years ago, um, Board of Supervisors implemented an underground utility regulation for the county and then the cities adopted it. And significantly, the utilities power telephone in Marin County are undergrounded. So all new construction that was required but it got adopted and re-implemented. And so the model of using regulatory authority to put everybody on an equal playing field and achieving our ends is a different model than financially competing with the independent carriers using taxpayer money as in a competitive sense. And, and I think it has some significant advantages. It gives, it's, it's a solid foundation for rec local government to implement. So setting up regulations that drives us forward is another approach. This is Steve. Uh, I think we spend a lot of times with local providers in applying for, at first, the ARA grant process, the BTOP program, and then for uh, CASF grants. And you know, we did board resolutions, board letters. I don't know how many times I drove down to San Francisco with a carload of elected officials to go to commission meetings. We went to the commissioner's individual offices and talked to them and really lobbied to get that funding approved for our community. Um, so I think that's where uh, local uh, cities, counties can, or school districts, I mean, everybody can really help them get their projects approved. We also do that internally to help them get through the permitting process. We really try to go out of our way to hand hold them through. And recently with uh, race communications that took over that CASF uh, funded fiber to the home project, we did a lease on airport property uh, for them to put their pop location and use as kind of their hub. And that, that was a win-win long-term lease for them, low cost. This is Anne, if I can ask a, um, just a general follow-up. Um, you know, in terms of uh, partnering with providers, and I think this also goes into the previous question, um, there, you know, we're, we're seeing um, different kinds of public-private partnerships rise up, you know, across the country. Um, so wondering if there are, you know, in, in some way, sometimes there their infrastructure, but then they are also, you know, in combination with roads or with other sorts of, um, you know, um, other other activities that then that are going to require that connectivity to provide an anchor. So I'm wondering if um, any of you, as you speak with your local government colleagues in other places, um, or if there are um, if there are PPPs that have come in front of you that seem of interest and, and you think are worth sort of exploring as potential models. Oh, and I see Cole, just go ahead. Sorry, I didn't realize you had your hand raised. No, that's okay. And it, it's pretty similar. And it was more of a, an echoing of Steve's comment, which was where I was headed, which was, just handholding internet service providers, especially on the local level through those advanced services funds. We put together a conference where we invited um, one of the senior engineers for the advanced services fund to sit down with uh, internet service providers um, and have kind of individual meetings. And I was shocked out of the, out of the five or six internet service providers that joined the conference and met with the, the advanced services in senior engineer, three of them didn't even know about advanced services funds and the, the potential pot of money available. So uh, that was a, a lesson for me in just being able to make sure you just have that initial contact with a local internet serv service provider to offer them help and walk them through some of the, the things that are in resources that are already available. I, and I see Dave has his hands up. Cole, just as a, um, uh, just a, a quick follow up, those providers, were those, um, how were they, were they smaller providers, bigger providers? What kinds of technology were you, were you looking at? Who were the folks who came when you said, hey, we're here to offer help? Yeah, so actually our conference, uh, Stephanie Tom joined us. And it was February and luckily we had it right before coronavirus. So we were actually in person with, why, uh, it was about two to 300 people that came to the county of Tuolumne 
and it was five counties. It was supervisors, it was municipal network um, uh, directors, it was internet service providers, it was our broadband kind of advocates. And then the internet service providers that came were all the, the larger names that could want it, that wanted to join, but some of the smaller networks that is met with the advanced services fund, it was a, a gambit between WISPs and uh, a couple individuals that wanted to do smaller fiber networks, which we were really interested in encouraging and helping try to get them to the advanced services fund. So that was what was really exciting was one of those local internet service providers was looking for ways to expand, um, which is really interesting because it came up a fiber network within their old um, television cable network from the, I think what you guys were saying, the 70s and 80s when it was installed in the, the high Sierra. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Dave, you want to go? I see you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, just two or three quick thoughts. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, to answer your question, I think the question on the table is, are there examples of these either P3s or these intergovernmental agreements. Uh, uh, for what it's worth, I was, I guess, one of the keynote speakers not too long ago over in the South Bay COG, which is Long Beach area. And I think it's next week they're going to dedicate, they have a little ribbon cutting or a fiber cutting where they're going to dedicate their, their first uh, uh, intergovernmental fiber ring. Uh, I don't think Caltrans is a part of that one necessarily or a major player, but the governments are doing it by themselves. Uh, I, I see Tim's on with me here the, out in the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs area, they're doing a similar kind of a fiber of the anchor institution. And I would also share that uh, if there is maybe one construct that, uh, that involves a state DOT, uh, Utah's doing a lot. Uh, we also work quite a bit with the Colorado DOT where they've actually established, uh, it's not a tariff, but for lack of a better word, it acts like and quacks like a tariff where if the state DOT or for that matter, other agencies have excess fiber, uh, you can rent it. It's, uh, it's an incredibly cheap price. It's government to government only. Uh, and then the government can do with it what they want. They can uh, do wave service or they can uh, use it as dark fiber, lit fiber. There's a lot of ways that they can use it. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I know uh, we've been doing some work uh, in, in and for Breckenridge, Colorado. They've got 100 miles, uh, two strands. So they're renting for a 20 year lease is what the Colorado DOT will do. And, uh, and there's an entire uh, ring they call it in Colorado Project 4 where the state DOT is leading the way and they're actually, they turned it into a revenue source, but it's a flat fee. It's arguably in direct competition with some of the major carriers and it's very, very successful. I think at the last count, they got 38 municipal governments on this uh, almost statewide fiber ring now that goes uh, from almost the Wyoming border out to Utah and then swings back into Southern Colorado. So it's a huge fiber ring that has this flat rate uh, that, uh, that uh, cities can go into and then they can flip it to the private sector through a P3. So, there's a lot of models out there. If you'd like some more information, we'd be glad to, uh, to help walk you through opportunities and constructs as they're often called. So that's great. Thank you, Dave. So we have a, a few minutes left and we just had one more, one more question. We talked a little bit about this. We heard Steve and he shared, you know, some of the challenges with the CAS program and maybe what we, what that could be done to help improve it. But, um, what funding models do you think best support deployment in your area? So this goes to, I guess, the funding, of course, the funding section of the action plan and um, any suggestions that, that you might have. And I'll just, I'll add a little, um, I don't know, a little cherry on top of this one. Since we haven't talked about adoption yet, um, would love to know if folks have thoughts as well around sort of funding models. So not just deployments for infrastructure, but also how do we, uh, in looking at an equity lens, really integrate adoption into those so that these aren't two separate pieces, but are really about getting people access, getting them on and making sure they have the skills to, to be able to use uh, use what they um, what they're subscribing to or have access to. I guess to to that question and um, you know echoing some of the comments that were made earlier about um, just some reform needed around the the. The advanced services fund, the broadband adoption accounts, um, 
and then you know I'm seeing the action plan, um, you know, recommendations for reform on the lifeline program. Um, yeah, I think those are all good recommendations, right? To kind of reform and, and better leverage all the existing funding mechanisms that that we already have um, to to more directly address the issues of affordability and adoption. Um, you know, especially in urban areas where you know, it's not 100%, but in many low income communities, you know, there is decent infrastructure. It, it's just, you know, folks can't afford um, the infrastructure at or the, the service at the prices that are, uh, it's being offered, or, you know, they, they might not be able to afford the devices to take advantage of it. So yeah, just uh, refining the eligibility on some of those um, existing programs. And then, you know, I think so much more could be done with Lifeline, um, you know, to make it more you know, 21st century, 2020 and, and on, you know, friendly. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's really not helping that much with the digital divide, you know, as, as we're experiencing it. So, yeah, those would be my funding recommendations, um, specifically for affordability and adoption. Thanks, Alex. Um, and also wondering, I know, you know, with um, Marin and, and Nevada, both of you guys have the um, uh, have plans in place or in progress? Um, are, do those look at funding models? And do they also look at adoption in there? Um, for us, we'll be looking at funding models and our plan and adoption and digital literacy are going to be a big part of it. Uh, we have already done some um, small scale public, uh, I'd say public private private citizen uh, projects, um, but we really have not focused on funding models at this moment. Uh, this is Ross in the Nevada schools. We, we, we tried hotspots uh, and it turns out you get pretty glitchy performance for students trying to work. Um, and so that worked fine, but we have switched back over to working with Comcast and their essentials program. And we, we got blocks of uh, allotments from them. And then the school district talks to the individual homeowner about the specifics of their connectivity so they don't feel like their privacy is being invaded and it's a service for their students to get online. And that's been a significant, uh, more reliable solution and more long-term solution. We're still working our way through this. It's all an experiment uh, to get kids online so they can learn. Um, but that that model has worked better than the hotspot model, which we also do for some where that's not available. It's and. Just as a note, Liza and I will be meeting this afternoon together. This is a, we're t double teaming you guys a little bit here. This is Steve. We've looked at uh, a number of, sorry, Ann. Uh, adoption hasn't been um, as great of an issue for us. It's really the connections. We just don't have the connections. So we've been looking at some funding models we're exploring right now as we kind of shift towards this uh, neighborhood approach, smaller project neighborhood approach. Um, we're looking at models like, you know, if you want to bring water to your neighborhood, piped water, you know, the, the water district does a low interest, you know, 20 year loan um, to the neighbors to, to put in that infrastructure. So we're looking at that model. We're looking at the PACE model for solar, where you can fund solar for your home and put that and pay that through your property taxes and that goes with the home if it sells. We're looking at, um, we have lots of private roads that form uh, community service uh, groups or associations and then tax themselves uh, with a parcel tax to pay for that road. So there's, there's several models out there we're looking at on how do you do that. The, the piece that has to go with that is the inclusion of low income because you can't a program like that without being able to address the low income need. So that's a challenge. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all today. There were a few extra comments there um, in our chat box, um, but we're just at about two o'clock. So we do want to respect everybody's time. Um, and just to share with you again, um, please feel free to provide any re written feedback uh, to the California Broadband Council, and you can share that written feedback by emailing it at the address on your screen, California Broadband Council at state.ca.gov. Uh, you can also provide additional feedback at the CBC meeting, 
The next meeting is on November 18th. So please feel free to um, participate in that meeting if you have some additional comments to make there. And the last thing we'd like to do is politely remind you that the deadline to submit written public comments is uh, Friday, November 20th at noon. So please um, get any additional comments in that you didn't have a chance maybe to say today, or if you're thinking about it and something else comes up later on, um, feel free to share it with the CBC um, in, in either of these methods. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, Anne, uh, uh, Stephanie, any closing comments or thoughts? Uh, the one I see is there's a great discussion going back and forth, um, and I would, sounds like a couple of us might be interested in having a, um, uh, a follow-on discussion with Novato and um, learning a little bit more about their experience, uh, both with, on the wireless side and um, on their sponsored internet side. So Ross, if you're open to that, it'd be great to connect with you. All right, great. Okay, thank you so much everybody for, for being here today and for providing us all of that great input. We really do appreciate your time and your thoughts. So have a great Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Bye.